Arts Club. I'm very happy that we can cement our relationship with the um, Washington Arts Museum. This is the second time that, or that you all have been here. Um, I'm basically going to just introduce you to the club, and in case you've never been here before, this club was founded in 1917 with that idea that we would support the arts in the city. Um, we maintain that type of commitment to the art. Yes? Are you just waving? <laughs> okay. I thought you couldn't hear me. Okay. Um, so anyway, um, Basically, we have two buildings here, and if you haven't had a chance to take a look at both the buildings, let me know and I can take you around. The buildings are from the 19th century. Um, this building over here was, was built in 1806. This building is from the 1870s. Um, we have an active program of public, uh, public events like we have tonight. Um, we have a series of luncheons and also evening um, events for the public. We also have member events, usually dinner with some sort of an entertainment afterwards. And if anybody's interested in finding out more about membership, just ask me after the presentation. Um, my biggest job tonight is introducing Betsy Tebow, who is going to tell you a little bit about the panel and um, get the evening started. So without Betsy Tebow. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. First, I'd like to make a There was some confusion over the parking. Uh, we have spoken to the Colonial Parking people, and if you have your parking ticket and uh, we'll go to the, uh, the desk at the front, Cheryl Kempler from the Arts Club will stamp it, and you should be able to get your ticket validated or refunded. That's what it was at. We're very sorry for the confusion over that. Can you hear me all right? I assume this is on. Uh, welcome to the second in a series of panel discussions on Washington art. Uh, my name is Betsy Tebow, and I'm on the History Committee of the Washington Arts Museum. Uh, it's a pleasure to collaborate once again with the Arts Club of Washington, and I'd like to give a special thanks to Cheryl Kempler, who's in the lot. She has been wonderful. She has been so supportive and a tireless liaison uh, with us and the Arts Club in helping to organize both this discussion tonight and the one back in March. I'd also like to acknowledge fellow members of WAM's History Committee, Nam Kevin McDonald, Hilary Hines, Jean Meisel, and H.B. Carruthers. I'd also like to thank Pat Gosley from the committee, or the, the board, the working board of the Washington Arts Museum for helping with several important aspects of tonight's event, uh, including the design along with Diano and Monica Busolati of the new WAM membership forms, which are available at the front desk. And if you have an already member of WAM, we encourage you to do so, uh, to take part in this exciting venture. I'd like to reiterate a little bit about WAM, even though uh, some of you have been here before or are members about it, or rather members of it. Uh, the Washington Arts Museum was founded in 1999. It was originally the brainchild of Giorgio Furioso and Lee Butler, and enthusiastic pioneers who were anxious to collect, preserve, exhibit, and promote the visual and performing arts in the Washington area. We're still a museum without walls, but we've already sponsored several events, including an exhibition in the old Woody's building in 2000, in the summer of 2000, of paintings and missions. We have a portfolio of prints from that show that's available for purchase if you'd like. Uh, most recently, we had an exhibition at District Fine Arts, guest curated by Anne. And uh, as part of our mission to preserve Washington art, We've been collecting tape interviews with persons involved in the local art scene and have started up a printed material. Uh, with that in mind, I'd like to introduce a very special person, artist Manon Cleary, who has a presentation to Wham that will add to our archive. Um, well, oops, I'm prepared. <laughs> well, today's my birthday. And Manon, so, stand up. Happy uh, birthday. Happy birthday. Happy birthday. Beverly Court, which was the beginning of the 70s, and it's a lithograph that was done by every artist in Beverly Court and signed, and um, it's the last one I have left, so I present it to Wham. Thank you so much. Uh, last March, we held a panel discussion at the Arts Club on the art of the 60s, and our distinguished panelists were Willem de Looper, Benjamin Forgey, Jenny Lee Knight, Lou Stovall, and Andrew Hudson. Tonight's event picks up where the previous one ended, with the 70s. It's possible in part by a generous grant from the Humanities Council of Washington, D.C., and we're very grateful for that. Our panelists tonight are Michael Clark, Virginia Daly, Claudia DeMonte, Jackson, Paul Richard, and our special surprise guest, who wasn't on our original announcement, Ramona Suna. 
And he's here thanks to a last minute cancellation of a plan. Here, Ron, here's a special gift for you. <laughs> <laughs> Michael Clark is executive director of MOCA DC, the Museum of Contemporary Art, Washington, DC. He's also a professional artist special painting and is shown in museums and galleries throughout the United States and abroad, including in the Washington area at the Corcoran Gallery of Art and the Phillips Collection. His interest in Washington art is more than geographical. Michael has painted images of George Washington for 30 years and has a deep knowledge of the early presidential portrait painter Gilbert Stuart. Virginia Daly was born in 1950 and raised in New York City. She moved to Washington, D.C. in 1972 and lived for a brief time in the Atlas Building. She showed with Franz Bader in the 70s and in the Corcoran USIA show and in Walter Hopp's 36-hour show for the Museum of Temporary Art. She is an established realistic landscape painter who works in oil and linen and featured in numerous shows throughout the United States and the world. Claudia DeMonte is a native New Yorker who splits her time between Washington and Manhattan. She first came to the district to study through the Catholic University, earning her degree in 1971. She's currently graduate director for the art program at the University of Maryland at College Park. In the 1970s, she showed at Henri Max Protech, the WPA's inaugural uh, exhibit, the Foundry Gallery, and the Corcoran 19th Area Exhibition. Since then, her mixed media pieces have been shown extensively in museums and galleries around the world and have garnered numerous awards. She's also lectured widely and participated in panels on art and is a published author. Jack Rasmussen came to D.C. in 1973 to study for an MFA at American University. He worked at the National Gallery while in school between 1974 and 75. He served as assistant director of the Washington Project for the Arts from 75 until 1978 when he opened his own gallery. He is currently executive director. Paul Richard was born in Chicago in 1939. He attended Harvard and studied architecture at the University of Pennsylvania, Louis Kahn and Robert Venturi. After the assassination of John F. Kennedy on November 22, 1963, Paul's birthday, he dropped out of graduate school. Broken in debt, he came to Washington and got a job as a cub reporter, writing obituaries and covering the police for the Post in December of that year. In 1967, he was made art critic for the Washington Post when Andrew Hudson resigned. After three decades of writing art reviews for the Washington Post, he is being retired. Uh, writing for the post six months out of the year. Our special surprise guest, Ramona Suna, came to Washington in 1960 and served as director of the Organization of American States Art Department from 1960 to 1969. In December of 1969, he opened the Pyramid Gallery and in January of 1979 changed its name to the Osuna Gallery, which, by which it has been known ever since. His gallery's locations changed from P Street to Street and Q Street. He now operates his gallery on a private basis, by appointment only. He also has a gallery in Miami. In the past 30 years, as he calculated himself this afternoon, he has held over 700 one-person shows in Washington, D.C. As you can see, we, have, we are very fortunate to assemble a very talented group of artists, curators, and critics for tonight's panel. I would now like to turn the panel discussion over to Paul Richard, who is its moderator. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I think I was first in the arts club in the 70s when I remembered the members were much older than they are now. Um, the 70s were clearly the golden age for uh, art makers in D.C. And so we're going to do a little uh, retrospective reverie tonight with, um, I thought rather than, you know, try to, theoretically, we would try to evoke what it felt like at that time. And um, I'm sure that everybody on the panel has prepared something to say, but before they do so, um, I wanted to just try to sort of do a downing dot painting of what it felt like at that time. One of the things I learned in the newspaper business uh, as an art critic in the 70s was all, all, no newspaper stories are about art, all newspaper stories are about people. And so I thought for, and I would pick 10 people, <coughs> mention them to you, the names of what I think will be familiar, not that they are the most uh, important players in town, but they were important to me at that time. <clears throat> and maybe if, we, if you call them to mind, we'll be able to sort of uh, remember what it was like oh so long ago. I first named Walter Hobbs, who I probably don't have to explain to you, but maybe you can remember his uh, American flag tie and, his, and uh, the 
kind of energy and centralizing uh, gravity that he had. He'd done the uh, great Gilliam Krebs McGowan show, um, Ed McGowan and his married to Claudia. He had done, um, he brought Stella and Keenholz and so much more to the modern art, and he was an immensely important player in the, throughout the 70s. The second person I uh, was thinking popped into my mind was Jonathan Meter, um, who represented another kind of art. Came out of a kind of non-art background, young, hippie, um, chemical-fueled, um, <laughs> unicorn-imagining, sky-studying. Um, but he too had some of that power that Walter had that, uh, to bring people together. And he was one of the people that uh, central anchor at the Beverly Court on Columbia Road. Um, the third is the late Henri. Um, dealers have always uh, played major roles here in the city, and Henri had some specialness. I thought that what she did more than anybody else is brought us stuff we didn't expect. Somehow, Walter was up in the big and um, lots of people were uh, sort of dealing with the Washington thing, but Henri was, to my mind, completely predictable and twinkled <coughs> kind of sparkly dust on my memories. I, Harry Lunn, also no longer with us, who I mentioned um, because he was a really skillful dealer, but he was the one who gave his whole heart to photography. And I think that one of the things that happened in the city at that time was the photograph. And sharp focus depictive image became of an interest that it had not been here in the 60s. Um, Tom, Tom Downing, the color painter of blessed memory, as, the, as a kind of a priestly sense, um, who was present and uh, believed with all his uh, soulful soul in the importance of painting and of colors. Um, I mentioned Lou Stovall, who uh, um, was a connection between parts of Washington that had not been connected. The name and in the 70s was when he started the workshop with the old Washington Yard Modern Art on uh, 21st Street. Steady, who I'm glad to say is here tonight, who uh, um, has, I mean, she doesn't belong with the 70s, she belongs to the 80s and the 90s and the 60s, and all well, I know, the 30s and the 40s and the 50s, <laughs> the next 20s. And, uh, but she's with us and has somehow a constant present more than almost anybody else in town. We're lucky on this panel tonight to have three people that I think are really gifted art entrepreneurs that show other people's art and deal with the art of others and try to make the whole Michael and Ramon and uh, Gracias, and, and that I think they would all agree that. Uh, um, we all have a lot to um, Joe Hirschhorn, I mentioned. Because by bringing his museum here, Joe, to the middle of the 70s, um, he sort of uh, changed the corporate very much to his uh, um, sadness and really may brought um, modern contemporary art and a new energy to that, to the mall that had not had it before. Um, I mentioned William Gertz, who might be a little less familiar to some of you. William Gertz was a scholar of 19th century art with the most precise and exciting knowledge of anybody in uh, the country in that field. He was teaching at the University of Maryland. And for me, he is the person that in the 70s started making, you saw it in the market, you later saw it in the exhibitions that we saw, started making 19th century American art and a kind of uh, nationalistic interest in areas previously unexplored uh, thoroughly exciting. He also sort of connected University of Maryland to the um, city's art scene. And last, a uh, hero of the time, who was kind of an invisible presence, who I think has been the most important single um, sort of soul force in Washington for the last 20 or 30s, and that's the late Paul Mellon, who gave us the National Gallery of Art and its attitude towards the public and its attitude to, towards you know, the, the great, generous, pleasant, instructive gift of beautiful pictures and beautiful surroundings. And I think that that, um, we're going to talk about the art scene tonight, but it's not to be forgotten that the National Gallery was for temporary shows. In the 70s, it had the King Talking Hammond show, was starting to do big blockbuster um, um, exhibitions that brought a quality to art and to the museum part of Washington that had not been here before. So try to imagine all those ten people swirling together. And if 
um, my people in the panel can somehow cast their minds back to those days when all those people around us, maybe before they make kind of statements, but just give really brief, is there anything that pops into your head from um, what life is like that might be? All I remember is the sex scene in the 70s. Yeah. Was, I think that's why Nolan Age. Uh, it was, I think it really uh, generated a lot of uh, excitement. And it, was, it was really wild. You read my, my autobiography, which I'm working on right now. You, you, I'll, I'll name names. But uh, that was one of the things that, uh, that was kind of interesting. That, uh, there was the Beverly Court scene, and uh, there, there was quite a few, and there was, like, Ramon was like a really big, he was one of the biggest movers and shakers in the early 70s with uh, the gallery on P Street. They were all on P, and they'd have these openings where they practically would close the street down. There were so many people, and I run into people all over the country, and they said, I lived in uh, D.C. in the 70s, and uh, and he goes, oh, did you ever go to P Street? And he says, yeah, Pyramid Gallery. It was like where the action was. And uh, it was like uh, all you mentioned um, are really uh, kind of ring bells. So Paul Mellon, I was so poor at the time, I, ha I actually uh, used the National Gallery as a studio, and that's where I learned to paint, uh, where you could go in, you had to get a letter that said you're an artist, and then you copies, and I would just start to do the part of the face and then branch out. And, uh, you know, worked on Rembrandts and stuff like that. And so I had a free studio down there, and, and then, uh, I went with the gallery and then I was walking around in the National Gallery one day and actually a painting, a, a work that I did a couple of blocks from the National Gallery was hanging in a show of old masters and uh, you know I thought somebody was knocking me off but it was somebody that Lund had sold it to had um, went to the National Gallery and, and uh, it was like you know really wild because um, I kind of subscribed to Paul's uh, uh, thing about Washington that it's like uh, um, there's a lot based on the Phillips and the National Gallery and uh, the, the tradition thing. I mean, Washington is, is a very provincial town and uh, people um, are like very conservative. So there was uh, this one major show that was uh, at the end of the decade, it ended the decade, but it started in 1980 and it started like Manon Clary, Kevin McDonald, um, uh, Brocky Stevenson. Um, there was about 10 people and they, they actually, one of the few contemporary shows that they, within about a month, they sold, they, they printed like about 25,000 catalogs and they all sold. But um, it kind of, the, the way things, I mean, the people become a lot more famous than they, they did. We're going to do it tonight, Michael. We're going to make them famous again. All right. Yeah. And they, um, it was, uh, you know, it was a fabulous show. And it, and it, it kind of got semi, I think it was sort of panned by Joanne Lewis. I don't know where you were that night. <laughs> And so it was very controversial, and then there was a, Washington's famous, they had a, a salon de refuse called the Laundry, and the Laundry actually upstaged the Corcoran, you know, and you know, they almost got more rhythm than the, the show at the Corcoran, which was a real formalist kind of, it was a very terrific show. And then Hobbs did this show called the Third Hours or 86 Hours or something like that, where he, he, he did speed and smoked cigarettes and drank coffee and stayed up. And, and millions of artists who'd never shown in D.C. showed up. Like Big Al was there. There were a lot of people. And back the, then, people... The idea of that show, excuse me, was like, that anybody who brought in art would get it on the wall. And he was there all 36 hours. So, you know, if you showed up at 3 or 4, you got more of his time. In the morning, you got more of his time. It was, like, really terrific. And um, uh, that, that sort of... That was when, when people really got more together and everything. And, and, and of course, Alice Denny's WPA was probably the more, that was a really great institution. And it it's brought people from all over the world there. And Jack was a big mover and shaker. Let's move, let me get the others. Then okay. We'll come back to you. What do you remember from there? Well, I remember that it was the hotbed of everything. It was the Watergate time. It was the roots of art for the probably the only time in our lifetime were coming from Washington. The color school people had made it. So we were here with international people, Gene Davis, Howard, these people that had made it internationally. And people looked to DC for the roots of art. Politics was a hotbed. I moved here and I had to go to the Lisner Auditorium to see Edward Villola dance. There was Kennedy Center, no, no the Sackler, the African Museum. And until Alice Denny came along and changed art in Washington, the WPA wasn't here. So I think it was just 
a lot of things converging at the same time, politically, art-wise, that, and, and you know, it, as he said, the golden age of sex, you know, after the pill and before, it was a very different time in our culture. Uh, Ramon, um, single-handedly has put about, on about as five times as many exhibitions as a whole national collection of called the Smithsonian's American Art Museum has done in, uh, with all its bureaucratic and uh, financial art of space. And uh, in the, as Michael said, in the um, 70s, um, his gallery was one of the nodes. There were many in town, but the pyramid was really important to all of us. Well, I think one thing we should have to think about the 70s, which is probably the most important thing that has happened in Washington in art, public school. There was only one artist, I, and I don't think there's been another one since, that was a household word, word all over the country and even in Europe, which was Gene Day. Anybody that would even ask you if you were from Washington, they say, oh, the stripes. The stripes ma made Washington the center at that moment of what was, you know, to a certain degree done in this country. And the other people that were in the color school, Howard Maring, we, which a lot of us forget, but which I think will, at one day, you know, people will realize what an important painter he was. Uh, Tom and, of course, uh, Dean Davis and, uh, to a certain degree, Paul Reed, you know, formed a, a cohesion of uh, important art, which has, I think, not been yet rivaled in Washington as a group. I mean, there have been many individual artists that have been very important, but as a school, it has not happened at all. And undoubtedly, it was the galleries at that time, the Jefferson Place Gallery, the uh, Drysdale Gallery, and uh, of course the Henri Gallery, which is oh, And undoubtedly, it was the galleries at that time, the Jefferson Place Gallery, the Protich uh, Drysdale Gallery, and uh, of course the Henri Gallery, which promoted these art. And at, a certain time, at the same time, they had the backing of the art critics of Washington, including Paul, Ben Forge, and some of the others that were writing at that time. So there was a conjunction also of collectors. There were, at that time, I would say it's been one of the times that Washington has had the most interesting collectors. There were people that had, you know, that were local, they were not from other places that came through the strong collections in Washington that later on have developed, that later developed into more international collections. So, I mean, it was the conjunction of many things, especially the creation of a school of painting that became internationally known, which has never had Washington. Well, Alice Denny asked me earlier if I had one word up, I would say wild was the word I picked. Um, it was a time of well, political unrest, protest, but action and a lot of creativity. And if you didn't have a place to get your art shown, if you weren't in one of the major galleries at the time, you just made a place. You organized something and you had either a party at somebody's or co-opted a more public spot. And it was uh, full of a lot of energy and spirit, um, very creative. And also it was a time of mixed media for me and, and cultures. It was very interwoven, jazz and art and black and white. It, it was just a time we haven't seen since. True. Hmm. Uh, Alice asked me the same question. And uh, I, I thought of uh, alternatives being that all the alternatives to the commercial gallery museum system were popping up, the WPA, the Museum of Temporary Art, DC Space, and Madame Zor and Adams Morgan. And, you know, just, you know, lots and lots of places were, were uh, coming online, I guess you'd say. And uh, so that made it a very exciting time. Uh, I moved here in 73, and uh, I knew just a couple things about DC. I knew William, I knew of uh, Joe Shannon, and I knew of the Washington Color School. Of course, I got the AU, and they'd never heard of any of those. <laughs> but that, that world was centered around uh, you know, Robert Gates and William Calfee and Joe Summerford, and all the people that came out of the Phillips Collection School of the 40s and 50s came over and formed the American University Art Department. So I, I come from a kind of a, a traditional background. Uh, I went from there to the uh, National Gallery of Art. In, um, Helene Hertzman said I should go down and talk to this crazy friend of hers named Alice Denny, uh, who was starting something. I should go see what it was. 
And of course, I went and visited this, you know, rundown. Well, all the adjectives that you used in your reviews: uh, <laughs> the, the pegboard on the walls, the scuffed linoleum. The, uh, uh, but you know, I, I loved it. And graduate, I was able to talk her into hiring me. I think uh, if I were to characterize, I think as opposed to now, I'd say that but there was a lot more clumping going on. There seemed to be little sort of nodes of artists around Beverly Court, around the Pyramid uh, Gallery, Henri Gallery, American University, Howard University, the corporate. Everybody had their own sort of really kind of hot scene was developing. So you could go from root, and it seemed to be, you know, each place had its own group of artists. And it was just, you know, I don't see anything like that now. It's just sort of this amorphous I you think it's also, there, if we talk about the college school because it seemed new and we believe that you know the future was shown in it, it should be remembered how easy we were at the time, varieties of style. If you look at that print that Bernard pulled out of the court, the people that lived in the court really knew each other well, and, uh, but they didn't paint in the same way. To be a kind of lyrical realist like Manon or um, sort of space, space painter like Gay Gladding or a Unicur and seeking printmaker like um, Jonathan or a uh, conceptualist like Alan Bridge, perfectly legit in this one building. I remember that it was through meter in the court that I met Mark Lighthouser, who's still designing the great exhibitions at the National Gallery. That it was through Walter that I met Lou Stovall, who was connected to the black nationalists who were around Howard University at the time. So that there were many clumps. You mentioned some, the Atlas Building, the court. Um, they were intermingling. The people from, don't forget her. Marjorie Goldberg. Yeah, and Marjorie Goldberg and the parties that were given. So that when you went to these places, you met people from these other worlds who had different aesthetics but all together shared a belief that art was really important and prophetic and mattered. Um, I don't think that confidence is with us today. Um, when, when you um, look going to be an art entrepreneur all these times, I'm asking three of you that have done it, Michael and Ramon, um, why did it fall apart? What was it? Was it? Well, there was a but there have been, been lots of recessions. Right, since. well, and everything stops, and then things pick up again, you know. I mean, you know, but, but the beginning of the 80s, I'd say, was the end of the 70s, you know. When, when, the other thing that happened was, uh, you know, I mean, Washington, D.C. was so cheap. I mean, there were lots and lots of spaces. The Development Land Agency, mm -hmm. you know, gave the WPA for a dollar a year. I mean, you know, there was just that kind of, I think that's why, you know, so much is happening in Baltimore today, because it's as depressed as Washington was, you know, 30 yeah. years ago. You know, it just creates a climate where the other good thing you had from an entrepreneurial point of view is inflation. You know, you just don't have inflation anymore. <laughs> right. you know, that really drove the art world. No, but I, I disagree. I think that the A, the first, especially the first three quarters of the 80s, economically were the best. It was really right. after the fall of the real estate titans in Washington that caused, to a certain degree, the down art market because they were the collectors and the people that surrounded them were the collectors. And uh, that did not take place, if I'm not mistaken, until about 88 or 89, uh, at, the end of, at the end of that, of that decade. What, what happened? Well, um, uh, the, peop the artists that I knew, all my, uh, my generation, my best buddies, uh, they're all dead, except for Kevin McDonald. And, uh, <laughs> he's a survivor. And, um, they, they, they were like both I'm downing. Um, they were very passionate about their art. Uh, Alan Bridge, he's dead. <coughs> Yuri Schwebler, he's dead. Uh, Tom Howard. Downing. Howard. Howard Marion. They were really so, and, and artists today are more like, you know, gee, oh, should I teach at the Corcoran or, uh, or, you know, UDC or Maryland? You know, I don't know. They're kind of not as uh, on the edges. And, and people were really, like, they had more of uh, the 50s thing of, uh, you know, they were really into uh, in the life. And, and a lot of them, they didn't have any nets underneath their trapeze. And uh, it was a uh, much different kind of thing. I mean, the problem is it's, it's hard to live that kind of that way. I mean, cheap pads and stuff like that really helped uh, and, and everything. But uh, a lot of people, it, it just, they had, uh, they had a tough time. I mean, you could pick up a big uh, Howard Marion painting for like 300 bucks in the late 60s. And uh, 
they, it's kind of kind of rough. I mean, you can still do it today. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, funny thing. But, you, but one thing, Michael, at that time there were fewer artists than there are That's now. That's true. How many, just think how many art schools there are in the world? Or even in, you know, in the United States? And how many graduates come out a year? They all have to end up being carpenters or something else because not all of them have the talent. The 60s was kind of a weird scene because if you weren't uh, doing uh, acrylic on raw canvas, it was hard to get a show. And, he, and there was a lot of, it's almost like the Impressionist school. There were a lot more people that were actually painting. But it was a very small scene. And there, there weren't, uh, it wasn't like now. There's just everybody and their uncle and aunt are artists, which makes it um, a lot different. <laughs> What, what do you think well, I think that the women's movement is something we can't ignore. There were no women showing. It was very hard to get a show as a woman. Oh, I'm sorry, I showed more women in Washington, D.C. than anybody else. I tell well, you that. You were the one. <laughs> because in gen and I appreciate that, but in general, the, the women's, we had to do women's shows to get shown initially. And the women's movement was, I also think another big thing that happened is, is David Driscoll came here from Fisk University and brought some great, great African-American artists to the University of Maryland. And, and including Martin Courier. So I think that's a, that's a gap that's, that's missing now. The energy that created the women's movement, and, and I think it was that the energy of the times was different than it is now. There, there are more artists, but there are probably more galleries now. But I, I don't think that the energy level is the same. Well, I think that the women at the time, when I met the art world of Washington, there were lots of powerful women. They didn't start. Adeline, Adeline, Adeline Burke, she was great. She met about, me and invited me to lunch. How about Lenny Stern? How about Nesta Dorrance? You know, I mean, yeah, these, yeah. these were important players. Alice, as we've mentioned. Um, but, and Henri. Yeah, but uh, not as many not artists. Not as many yeah. artists. Yeah. I had a feeling, looking back, maybe it's just an old guy's sourness, but I think it was a great time for painting, and it isn't now. Um, that's being as a fan of painting. I look back the last 20, 25 years, and I think, well, it, at least it was a great time for cooking. I think it was a really fabulous two decades for fresh herbs and good recipes and cooking shows. But nothing comparable seemed to me to be happening in this. And I would see lots of uh, big photographs or room size installations or videos that I really had very little patience with or, or interest in. And in some way, also squeezing the art at time was this growing industry of the traveling old master or um, never seen before exhibition. Um, let me just a minute and tell you 10 things. I got the National Gallery to send me a list of the shows they did in the 70s. And I just want to tell you what, what kind of thing was being laid before not only the artists, who some like Michael who worked there, and the, um, the dealers and the collectors who were trying to hone their taste. But just what was possible with colored goo on a piece of cloth or something not that. In 1970 they did, um, with this guy um, Bernard Fagg from the British Museum, they did the first really great show of African sculpture, the best pieces they could find around the planet. And suddenly there was a, a black presence in this otherwise totally European and a big trompe l'oeil painting. That was in 1970. I'm just picking two. In 1971, they did the anger in Rome, those little meticulous pencil drawings that uh, Hockney now says were made with, with lenses and machines, but the, the quality of drawing that was not available elsewhere in the city. And uh, Mark Lighthouser and Gil Ravenel's first show together, which was called Durer in America, and was the German artists, oh, all his wood etchings and prints, and fakes of many of them. Um, they, last year they did an Escher, um, a show filled with young people, and uh, Old Master Drawings from the Church Oxford, which was one of a number of shows almost every year. The late Anne Marie Pope, another woman at the yeah, time, who just died this week. Um, yeah, um, they had no, no curators to speak of at the National Gallery, but Anne Marie and Johnny Walker, who was the director of Carter Brown, would um, put together these little shows. Some are still being done now. The idea was 100 master drawings from, and they would go to Christchurch College, Oxford, or the Art Institute of Chicago, and pull these fabulous drawings tracing post-Renaissance art. Um, in 1973, the great Eskimo and uh, Inuit show, The Far North, um, remember with the skulls and the beadwork of the ground. 
Um, the, the waning of the Cold War made possible the Impressionist and Post-Impressionist paintings from the Hermitage and uh, all of Rembrandt's etchings. In 74, they did Art in Motion, which great was show. a great show. Robert Ferris Thompson. Robert Ferris Thompson, you remember. Absolutely. And it was the idea that the African art we'd always seen and still see sitting in plastic boxes. What well, made for that was to be danced and, and seen and seen in the flickering of shadows and used. And this show made that apparent. They also did uh, the, uh, the first show of Chinese China. We were just getting Nixon had just gone to China. We got the great archaeological treasures. Um, Maybe you remember that little, the winged horse from Hanse that sat, you know, with little wings on its heels that uh, was the mark of that show. Um, in 75, um, more from the Hermitage and the State Russian Museum, the Trepnikov in Leningrad, and all the Winslow Homer watercolors. Um, in 76, um, Goya and the Prado, a big Goya show, and the King Tut show, which really was the first one that somehow lit a fuse. The lines were around the block. Um, um, and you know, only a, about 30 of amazing exhibition. The next year, no robes and masks from the Tokugawa collection, and the cutouts by Matisse. I don't know if you remember. You look behind us at the Phillips and what the Phillips had done to AU and, and the seedbed of color painting in this town. This was sort of a French international aeration of that idea into some great Matisse paradise. Um, in 78, the splendors of Dresden. Do you remember that Kunstkammer show with? the porcelain, the Rembrandts, the Leonardos, plus uh, the great Edward Munch retrospective. I keep saying great, but these were fabulous shows. Um, 79, um, again, the Russians sent us their Italian Renaissance paintings, and uh, the Galanders collection of Cycladic art. And in um, 1972, there were nine exhibitions at the National Gallery. In 1979, they were already doing 20 a year. Um, as Claudia mentioned, there are a lot of museums that we have now that weren't even open then, didn't exist. So that I'm really interested in saying, is this a boon for our, our, and a city where art matters to have, for the first time really in human history, all of this treasure spread, usually at no cost, for your delicate? Or does it squash it all? And uh, as an artist, what do you think, Jim? Uh, we've had this discussion before, and uh, it obviously did something, or there is some correlation. I, I'm not sure whether we just didn't get tired of all that running around and protesting right. <laughs> energy in the 80s. I, mean, um, I think people went into their own worlds. They, they stopped doing the little party in the nubs, and that's what I did anyway. I went sort of more into the cave and viewed stuff. and. But don't you um, think that, I'm sorry, I was just thinking in a way, maybe it did, maybe it's hurt artists, it's helped artists as far as visually helped us, but maybe it's hurt us career-wise. Because yeah, people would come here, the NEA started in the 70s, how can we not forget it? Right. From New York came here all the time because the money was here. They had to come here to get, you know, there was Michael Strait, Mary and Ty running the endowment, these were very influential big people at the time. But they were coming to see the museums, where the, but did it affect the local arts as far as exposure? Yeah. It may have been, yeah. it, it, it helped our heads well, internally it, make better art for us. Those people visited had a, a morning to spend. Yeah, yeah. yeah could have gone to the pyramid or the WCA. Yeah. 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 They did come. Yeah. There, some of them, you know, some of them bought, others did not. But there was a trickle of it. I won't say an avalanche, but there was a trickle. There was a trickle. And they gave us shows out of town from because of it too. That's right. There's some collectors came in and saw the work and were, were trustees of their museums in some of the places of the country, and then they asked for their painter, you know, this painter, to come over, or they sent their curator to see them. But not enough. Well, no. 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 I think you have to remember that, too, this was the heyday of Clem Greenberg and his... Uh, and uh, in some ways, he helped Washington and gave us some uh, yes. theoretical but legitimacy. He, and other way, he was a really mean guy. He put it a knife in the back of most of the uh, right. color field artists. Two of the things. But he had a belief that if not in his vocabulary or not, was shared in, to, in some variety by lots of people, that there was a way to go. And the broad, sunlit uplands were in front of you if you took this path. And there was some kind of historical imperative, whether it was in feminism or black liberation or color painting, that would prove yourself right. From the point of view of one looking back at this, a lot of dreams to me seem not to have been fulfilled 
in this way. That the confidence that we had that, um, you know, flatness mattered seems a little, I, I don't know quite what we were thinking of at the time. Well, he died in a certain obscurity in a way. Yeah, but it, at that time it was energetic. I'm, often when I think back and looking at those 30 years that I was paying look at art, and think to myself, what was, what's the headline? What's the lead? What, what leaps out of this that was most important? It seems to me that the thing that had never happened in Washington before, or in America before, was that it was the time, and the 70s were the, the pivot of this time, where we got everything else. If you looked around and saw what was available, you would see in a Titian or a Monk or in a No Robe or in an Escher print things that belong that were just as new to our eyes, just as you know, wow, I never saw that before, as anything made by the painters in town. And it's very stiff competition. It's of course history behind us, but it had never been here before. It isn't. It wasn't as if we had walked by the mall and you know been able to see African art ever before. So that I have a feeling the things, it's, it's again like almost like a field painting, things became sort of non-hierarchical and equally important. And that sense of being able to find channels that would take you forward, the channels grew narrower and narrower, shallower and shallower, I think, because we were thrown on our own individual um, resources. is, you know, you, you, of all the people at this table, it's Ramon who tried to sell art here, make art here. Is it possible to make a living selling art in D.C. now? I don't know nowadays, because I, might, I deal more in dead artists, and mostly, you know, in sort of, in no place, you know, wherever there is a collector that's interested in what I'm saying. But I have a feeling, at least because of September, because I follow the galleries quite closely here and I go to a lot of the shows, I think that there was starting to be a revitalization of the whole scene. I was thinking, I started seeing it within, I would say, the last year and a half, and I think if, uh, if times were normal, I would believe that a, set, a new scene could get started here. It was, I was starting to see the beginning of it. And we'll see whether these uh, international events uh, has stopped it for the moment, or, you know, killed it completely. The other thing that should be mentioned that set Washington apart then and now, <clears throat> this has always been a painting town. Um, in my criticism, that was always my bias. I always liked the pictures best. Um, Sculptureton had always somehow belonged to the Civil War generals and the parks, and was not really available in, in serious ways. Sculptors found that, I think, you would remember, really working against them. Duncan, Duncan and Marjorie Phillips had built what is, in fact, a picture gallery. They had a, a calder made out of a coffee can, but that was about it as sculpture goes. When um, Andrew Mellon ordered the National Gallery, it was, again, a picture gallery. There were a few statues and decorations in the big halls, but what you got on the walls were. The Corcoran, every two years, had its great biennial exhibition of American painting not of American installations or American photographs, American painting. And there was some, I think, belief in a city where the paintings were being shown up, the history was being slid under us, in that if you worked with, with brushes and, and color, that was the path to go. I think by the end of the 70s, that faith was um, being dented and being eroded. And I want really like to ask you this to the people here. Well, is painting um, coming back? Is it? No, but the courtesy of the courtesy of time for right. painting always. But going back to sculpture, as you were mentioning, one of the leading sculptors uh, that lived here in Washington, which is Anne Truitt, yeah. it relates to color. You know? can, yeah, there's, they're paintings, but they're paintings. The sculpture well, paintings. She, you know, she might not agree with you, but yeah. but I mean they relate absolutely to color. <coughs> I mean, so really that you know sort of gives the basis to what you you were saying. John is really a painting town. I mean, I don't see a painting. I don't see it as a city where you see the installations, or maybe now you're starting to see more of an art that relates to the to film in a way. But remember Rockney Krebs too, another sculptor of that time. Uh -huh. He did in the mall this fabulous drawing with laser beams that, you know, floated from the uh, 
seat of Mr. Lincoln in the Lincoln Memorial, you know, to one on each side of the Washington Monument to the steps in front of the Capitol and bounced around. It was, but it was, it felt like a drawing in space, the way Anne Truitt's things feel like paintings exactly. in space. There was so much new technology then, yeah. new materials, new technology, plastics, all that things. That was when Ed McGowan was showing with Eva Hess in New York at the time. It's hard to remember that. that but there's new technology now. Do you think that we'll see that? Could that happen again, where Rockne, uh, Rockerson would? I think that the Hollywood owns it now to, to a degree, and it's been sort of, the excitement of it isn't so new anymore. I mean, new technology is oh yeah. Oh, well, there, there was an exhibition called Art and Technology. I think it was held right. at the Brooklyn Museum that had all these things in the 60s. It's really nothing, right. nothing new. With that big um, vat of bubbling mud by Rauschenberg. Do you remember that thing? <laughs> but, or, or. but when you see and, and try to do, when you're uh, you as a painter, you're a painter. You're, I'm still you're a loyalty. painter. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Um, I don't know. The 90s were really good for me. I, you know, I sold out like crazy. I'm still trying to catch up. Um, I need a dealer. Keep up with right. um, but, uh, but just to get back to the 70s for a minute, because it, it's interesting when Claire said do to you, and that's what I was going to say. When we were down at the Atlas Building, it's funny for me as a painter, staunchly a realist landscape painter now, I was doing very. Uh, um, conceptual uh, things that had to do with physics and psychology. But what we were doing at the Atlas Building had to do with video, which was brand new then. We had some guy who claimed to be the cousin or nephew of Buckminster Fuller, and he brought in a video camera that was like five times the size of that. And, and porta packs, well, you couldn't even pick them. And uh, we were making very odd uh, installation music uh, videos, all mixed up. And what we did was we, Kurt Viertaler, who was the mastermind or crazy person behind this, one of his ideas was you had to have alternative spaces. And one of his ideas, for aside from the Watergate in 1972, where we had Gallery X, is to project these movies in the metro, in the tunnels of the metro, the followed out for Metro Center completely illegally. Now, you know, the people when they say, oh, well, now it's all video, this is the painting, I'm going, we did that already. Jack, when you look back for the, <laughs> now, some years in it, what do you, do you see anything, I mean, this well, one of a kind, or coming back? Well, I remember uh, at the WPA, uh, we started having installations, uh, performance arts, you know, coming along, and, you know, I knew that would never last. Um, it's a joke. <laughs> right, right. My big line of the evening. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, <laughs> so I mean, I mean, I'm still doing, you know, I'm doing shows a month now, uh, you know, and it's it's incredible. She, you know, it's it's. I'm still showing painting because I love it, but I'm, I'm an anachronism, really, in the contemporary art scene, you know, for doing that. I mean, do you feel that? Yeah, a little bit. Yeah. Um, I, well, I think it's just out of fashion at the moment. Yeah. I mean, and, and you know, right. it, it like, comes and goes. You know, painting will never die. I can tell you that. I mean, I'm not showing it because I'm showing it because I think they're the best artists, but uh, you know, it's, uh, it is out of fashion, right? Um, it was the baby boom that had something to do with it too. There were just a lot of young people who had grown up in flush times. Um, the parents had been so glad, as my parents had been, to have the war, Second World War, but behind them and the Depression. Money was starting to come in. And uh, then there was the miracle of marijuana and LSD <laughs> and all that brain-liberating stuff. And I was saying, when I look back and think how, how oddly interwoven all of this is, you know, remembering that Paul Mellon was the guy who paid for, his name appears nowhere in it, for the I Ching, the Chinese Book of Changes, which was um, a Bible of um, the sort of hippie spacey people. And these people were not in contact. There was none of that feeling of 19th century Paris, um, that, oh, here is the establishment, and here are the, you know, the outsiders trying to get the out The establishment loved the outsiders, and the outsiders kept going to the establishment, in this case was the museums, and soaking up what was there. Um, open distance from the, 
Yeah. Well, I wanted to say that I'm uh, taking on what Michael said, that um, it was sexier, and um, along with that, it was more fun. Maybe one had to do with the other, but um, I think somewhere along the line, the art world stopped being fun, and I think that's what made it deadly. The other thing is I believe that uh, the 70s was a time of great democracy in the arts. I think that anybody, regardless of their background, could become an artist. They didn't have to be rich. They didn't have to be the wife of someone. They didn't have to be um, a trucker. They could be anything and become an artist. And the same was true of collectors. Because art was not expensive, anybody could and did collect <coughs> art. I uh, ran across my household inventory. I'm trying to make room for my in the apartment. And I ran across a household inventory, and I was amazed at how little I had paid for art from that period and how really great the art period was. It just, um, it got snobby, I think. Well, I've been paid little, I gave you a very good price. <laughs> <laughs> and you, you yeah. talk about that, it's trying to sell it. It's really hard to sell art in Washington, and especially to get any money for it. Um, everybody wants a deal, and they want to hold their hand and guarantee it's going to go up in value. And I think went more. They hired publicists and started. They turned uh, they turned the art world into showbiz scene, which has paid off. Where the D.C. people were kind of, you know, um, they were just like living in their garrets, basically just making art, waiting for somebody to come in on a white horse and, and make something <coughs> out of them. I forgot to mention a couple of other art legends that I used to hang out with. Joseph P. White, he was, he was a really great artist. He was un underrated. And uh, the legendary Carol Sockwell, who's dead. And, you know, these guys really had their ass out on the line. And it's too bad that the collectors just didn't, you know, because the stuff was inexpensive. I mean, they could have, you could have picked up the whole Washington Color thing, Sus Lewis, for, you know, chump change. And the people here just, I don't know, they're, they're, they can do crossword puzzles real well and they do really good on uh, Jeopardy and another TV show, Wheel of Fame. When it comes to visual arts, they, they are like blind and it's really hard to um, get people to, um, to educate them because they don't really want to be educated here. They see, a, you know, uh, a bird is a bird is a bird and they buy a bird painting. But when you get into the abstraction and things like that, without like what Ramon was doing, where he had an international movement that co coalesced. Uh, and those guys were really, I worked with Downing for a little while, and he was an incredibly inspiring guy. And I hung out with Gene Davis quite a bit, and I did a project with uh, Ed McGowan and, and Douglas Davis, who went on to writing fame. And he actually was with uh, Ronald Feldman. And then there was Juan Downey, who was like an incredible genius, uh, who's the right, he's world famous now, who was a, uh, started here in D.C. And then Yuri Schwebler actually used the Washington Monument. It took him eight years for him to get his snow so he could into a, uh, the, and it was, it got international coverage, uh, the sundial of the Washington Monument, which was a really big thing. I think there's a lot of really great artists here. But they never get. The, it's like if you're running a choo-choo train, you have to keep putting coal in the into the firebox. And a, a lot of the people just ran out of gas or ran out of coal. I think it was happening elsewhere too. I mean, Washington was not all by itself. Um, last earlier the, last month, I guess uh, there was a party at the Hirshhorn to say goodbye to Dimitri and the direct departing director. And I saw Frank Stella there. And in the late 60s, 70s, he was my hero. I thought he was, you know, the cast pajamas as a daring, you know, forging ahead abstract painter. And he's still making really interesting art. But when did you last time, you know, see him in the, in the sort of gossip pages or men? And I think that there was um, a belief in sort of noble and important and, you know, soul revealing and that people then found themselves out at the end at the end of the limb by themselves and the public didn't follow, it seems to me. Is that because this is a political city where this that's not that's not the main thing that matters here? Uh, yeah, I think it's it's not at all what matters. And there's also look at how we're dressed, even for an artist. That in to this is a city that 
in, in New York or Los Angeles, where it is a form of showing status and newness and freshness and now sound of todayness. And Washington, that's what people, just what people don't want. They want to make it, they want the sort of um, weight of precedent working in their favor. <clears throat> if you get rich in New York in the options market or, you know, your show hits it on Broadway or you're L.A. and, you know, you're, you're, you make a series or sell a series to HBO, you make millions of dollars. And to decorate your flat or, or, your, or your house with big paintings is a small expense. Here, if you're promoted from deputy undersecretary to undersecretary, you might make a few thousand dollars more a year and nobody expects you to change your style. And in some way, it was not, maybe the dot-coms will change it or did change it in some way, but I didn't see it very much. In some way, it was not uh, a place where to surround yourself with visual luxury considered uh, a path upwards. There were two professions that were not very much in vogue in the art world in the 70s and that later became completely in vogue in the 80s which was the decorating the art consultant. Mm -hmm. Anybody in the 80s could be an art consultant. <laughs> and no lady in Washington ever bought a painting without bringing in her decorator. Mm -hmm. And that did not exist in the 70s. It mm -hmm. really was something that took place in the 80s. And they, to a certain degree, domineering a little bit the art world. Yeah, well, Ramon uh, showed this guy that was like the, one of the most incredible photographers with George DeRoe. George DeRoe. Yeah. And this guy, like uh, Robert Maplethorpe, totally knocked him off. Ramon, you had like three, four shows of his, and they were like incredible photos of black men uh -huh. in the nude. Uh, and, midget, uh, midgets. Well, <laughs> artists, <laughs> artists, some of the black yeah, artists, yeah. black midgets. They were, they were really incredible. If you, uh, if you see his work and you think of Maplethorpe, you can see, well, and that came from so Ramon actually. I can tell you that story. I mean, Duro came up to Washington for that exhibition, and he said he wanted to go to New York to meet Maplethorpe. So it was a Maplethorpe, and he invited Maplethorpe to come down to his studio in New Orleans, where Maplethorpe went and spent a month there and copied him completely and then came out of his books in New York. Thank you. Here you go. There you have. So there's been a lot of things uh, that really came down, and Alice and Jack showed uh, Anna Mignard. How do you pronounce that? Yeah, they, there was a. Anna Mendieta. Yeah, there was a show, and it was like installation pieces. I had like this kind of Coney Island deal. This kind of, couldn't get in it. You had to look through a window to see these paintings, and the Corcoran actually bought a big one. And you know, there was there was a lot of really cool stuff going on, but everybody gets underrated on what they let's, let's did. Get, uh, I just wanted to comment that uh, Claudia DeMonte provided a lot of fun for us when she did at the Corcoran her shirt exchange. Uh, did we have to bring a can of Del Monte? <laughs> Something <laughs> rather to get a Del Monte. See, that was a lot of fun, and that was in the 70s, wasn't it? Yes. And your list of your list of men. That wasn't mine. Don Corrigan did that. No, no, you did something. He, he did, did it about the about, he did it about, about you. Yeah. What was that? He, he rated things in the nicest artists in Washington. He did a list of the men in my life. Which <laughs> yes. Which my husband was not first. I would just like. To <laughs> Me and Tom Downing were down on <laughs> right. of, uh, the meanest artist in Washington, or something like that. Oh, that oh, wacky dude! But he he did the uh, Sam Gilliam, the thing where he went and he his drop cloth from Sam Gilliam and cut him up. Uh, I shouldn't really tell this story, but <laughs> uh, he he was a really irreverent person, and he um, he cut him up and then had this sheet of paper. I have mine somewhere. And so it was like you get an original Sam Gilliam. Well, Sam blew about five gaskets when he heard that you could, where, where was he? Show this at Henri, too. And uh, they had all these, like, chopped up uh, Sam Gilliam. I mean, it was just this floor thing, and he thought it was real hoot. He was, they actually ran him out of town on a rail car. So he went to New York and became a customs agent. I don't understand that. Were we just were we just younger, and yes. so it felt like there was more energy. And the people today that are thirty or something feel that, and we're just old. Or is it really <laughs> is it really different? I think that's what I say. I think we got tired. No, I just like to comment um, as to what you're saying. Um, I think there's impermanence today, and back in the in the seventies, you these that were up for six months. Today. Yeah. You don't have that. We, uh, you, uh, Paul, mentioning seeing the uh, the no costumes, the presentations at the uh, museums. 
seeing the first time. We, today we are bombarded visually. So exhaustion, I don't think it's being exhausted that we are old and being less, having less energy. <laughs> no, there's too much. We're, 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 we're seeing too much and there's an impermanence. It's happening so quickly. It's been an acceleration, acceleration, acceleration. Yes. It's just too much. To... <laughs> well, we, did, we did a show uh, that's up right now. If you go to Connecticut and, um, and uh, yes, S Street at, at the, what is it, Museum of Contemporary Art with Starwood uh, Realty. Where he took this, there's 12 paintings of these, uh, Felicity Hogan, who's a co-director at MOCA, and I worked and we got this thing together. We've got all these young artists who were like, we, they, they, uh, a whole bunch of uh, major graffiti guys flew in from all over the country and there's an incredible wall and it's become a tourist attraction. We're all in their 20s except for the, the painter Zephyr who's like, he was born and grew up in Bethesda but went to New York and it's like a really exciting kind of scene, um, but they're coming from a whole different direction and they want to communicate. They're different artists than their garrets. These guys are, have international, they're follow, they have websites. You have to be very energetic today and uh, they get up and put things like illegal things up. We're trying to get them to come into the galleries because it's some of the freshest stuff going on and, and paint most abstract painters and they've never even been to the Corcoran. Uh, we got this cool Disco Dan piece in there that and got because everybody knows who he is, um, and um, it's like uh, the guys that that uh, did the show. Never, the kids today have never even been to the National Gallery or the Corcoran. It's a whole different scene. So it's we're in a different world. I think, like Steve said, it's more to the street, which is what Al Nodell, when he was down at the WPA, uh, yeah, he, he did an incredible number of uh, art projects from the late '70s and early '80s uh, on the streets and. I think you almost have to go to where the people are rather than trying to uh, lure. Well, I know the kids are not going to do it again because the aren't reaching out to them. They talk about it and they're not doing it. And in the 70s was a period when museums like the National Museum of America, Joshua Taylor, who, you know, I would put up there ahead of Bill Gertz, legitimized American art because of the Yeah, Joshua really, uh, we'll just the last word, Joshua really deserves mention as another one of those saint, men of sainted memory or people of sainted memory who, due to that love of pictures, that wholehearted love of pictures that was so broad for those times, maybe we'll come back again. Thank well, you. Uh, I was just thinking it might be fun to have for our next panel discussion a group of the young entrepreneurs from this period, from the 2000s, and see what they in the meantime, though, this has been a wonderful evening. Thank you so much. I appreciate all of you. Cheryl or myself about your uh, parking problems, and if we can't validate it, you say that we have to pay you back your $5. Thank you. Happy trails to you until we meet again. Happy trails to you. Keep smiling until then. Who cares about the clouds if we're together? Just sing a song and bring the sunny weather. Happy trails. See you.